Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley. Uh, we're going to give people a minute to jump in by joining us from their lunchtime. I'm also going to share this to our Facebook page, The Natural Pet Doctor, as we give people a minute. So let me do that. I'd love for you to drop in the chat box where you are joining us live from. Uh, so just comment your name and where you're joining. We love to see where everyone is in the world. Um, let me do this and then we will share this. So give me a minute. I see you all. This is awesome. We've got a good group of pet parents here today. All right, let me get this shared. And then that way, also, if you're on Facebook, make sure you check out the naturalpetdoctor.com. There's some links in there that will help guide you um, for some of the amazing information that we are going to be talking about today um, with the amazing <laughs> Dr. Betsy Redman that is joining me today. Okay, let me push that and make sure we are there. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Okay, we are all set. So I see I see people popping in is that chat box. Let me see. The chat box is working. If not, don't worry. We have a Q&A. Yes, awesome. The Q&A, awesome. Liz, I see you from Niagara and Canada. The chat box is not working. Don't worry. We're going to be doing a short Q&A session at the end because I know some questions are going to come up with the testing and what we're going to be talking about with gut health today. So I know people are probably joining from lunchtime. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce my amazing guest today, Dr. Betsy Redman. Um, a lot of you may not know her, but after this, you're going to want to know her and you're, wanna, you're going to want to know the company Innovative Pet Laboratory because they're doing some amazing work to help improve and better pet guts and also their overall health and improve longevity. So Dr. Redman, thank you so much for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Redman, has worked in a clinical laboratory education and research for the last 20 years. She currently runs Nutrition Provisions, a private practice that focuses on individualizing science research and is a senior medical educator and researcher for a functional medical laboratory. She holds degrees in nutrition and environmental science from Texas Christian University, a master's of medical science from Emory University, and earned a PhD in nutrition from the University of Georgia. Much of her work has focused on gut health and applying metabolomics, I just butchered that, the study of metabolites <laughs> in practice and the differences across species. Also residing in Atlanta, Dr. Redman enjoys spending time with her husband, three kids, and two dogs, Ollie and Linda, who I've heard a lot about Linda, <laughs> yeah. she, quite the personality. She also enjoys running and can never get enough of researching. It's her passion. And this is why I am so excited to talk with you, Dr. Betsy, today and hear all about what you've been doing, some of the exciting tests that have come out, and how the incredible pet parents who are joining us today can actually use these tests to help their pets. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yes, Linda's Linda's in the room, so hopefully she's <laughs> around. Very old. So we'll hear some of the crazy, crazy antics from Linda today. So, um, if that's the case, it's okay. We're all pet parents; we understand. It's yeah, okay. Perfect. So, first off, you know, gut health is such a big topic, and it's a newer area of research. And when I say newer, there is a lot of education and research on the human side, and we're kind of becoming more aware of it on the pet side. And so can you start off, Dr. Betsy, with like briefly discussing the anatomy, some of the physiology of the gut, kind of the gut lining, the immune system, kind of at that higher level to help us get started and how it's impacting our pet's gut health? Yeah, I mean, and I would say that there has been more, you know, there's been pet research, but it wasn't directed. It was like human research and they start, you know, you know, with animals and then they, you know, they go at rats and then they move up. So I, when we started looking at this, like, hey, let's, can we do our pets? Can we put our dogs in there? They're having problems. We looked at back at the research and it's like they have quite a bit. And then some of it, they, they do have a lot of research on. So, yeah. you know, we want to see the big things we're looking at, um, you know, with, with gut health is, is there any inflammation? 
is there, you know, the gut lining, you know, how we can see, can we look inside and see a gut lining and see if that's all tightly and put back together, you know, is digestion and absorption going well? I mean, I think everybody's probably heard the statistics, I mean, I just hear it all the time, that, you know, 70% of the immune system is in the gut. There's just so much activity and it makes sense because the gut's really kind of outside your body, it hasn't entered. It's like within the gut lumen, it's still outside. So your system is pretty protective um, mm. over it. So I yeah. think that the two biggest areas we look at are like inflammation and immunity. Yeah, and in terms of, so how would, how would we know if a pet has like an inflamed gut or if like the immunity is not optimized with you know something going on? Because I know, I find this a lot of times, especially working with clients and patients is, you know, for example, we see a lot of allergies and we, we treat the symptom of itchiness or the skin infection, but a lot of times we forget that it may have actually originated with an inflamed gut or an immune system issue. That's a problem in the gut itself. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So we, for inflammation and immunity, the two markers that we thought were important is calprotectant and secretory IgA. So, oh, wait, I see your cat. Yeah. Yeah. We got one <laughs> blending into the back black rug behind me. The little eyes. The little eyes. <laughs> yes, they're glowing. <laughs> so like, so calprotectant, it's, it's got, you know, it's got a lot of good science in people and pets. Um, but it's specifically, a, it, it's a cow granulal, granulin family. It's like metabolomics, not every, <laughs> um, so it, which is, it's, a, they're a family of proteins that's associated with acute and chronic inflammation. So um, specifically we're looking at calprotectin, which is, it's a S100 AAA9 protein. Cause you'll see sometimes there's like A12s or different, different things, but Calprotectin is looking at inflammation. So it's looking at, you know, cell pol proliferation. It looks at um, like turnover. It's, it's really a marker of like danger, something, something's happening. So when I think of it, I think of it as it's um, identifying neutrophil infiltration into the gut lining. So neutrophils are white blood cells you know, within that family and then just within the gut lining. So it's reacting to something that's happening. And so it's directly related to inflammation. Yeah. Um, and, and I then, think mm -hmm. too, just to touch on that briefly for um, other people is, you know, those those white blood cells are like the things that are fighting infection, but also come, as you're saying, the inflammation. So keep that in mind, the neutrophils are just one set of the white blood cells. And the other thing I wanted to clarify too, Dr. Betsy, is it with the calprotectin, is it identifying more like acute inflammation or chronic inflammation, or is it doing both? So like if our pets say like, for example, like you cut yourself, right? We have acute inflammation, we mount an immune response, the white blood cells come and they, they fix it all up. Hopefully we don't get an infection and we resolve it. We don't go into a chronic inflammatory state, but with the gut, we can have acute and chronic, correct? And so mm -hmm. what's in terms of using calprotectin for those situations, what would be the best situation or like the half-life of it? Or is that something that there's more research being done on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, it doesn't have like a, like a half-life, you know, I think like IgG has a half-life that I can like three weeks and, um, but calprotectin does look at chronic and acute. So it's, it's, you know, it's got a lot of benefits for why you would look at it. Um, you know, it has other properties besides just identifying it, you know, it has um, bacteriostatic, it has fungostatic, so it can kind of decrease the ability of bacteria or fungus to, to keep growing. Um, it does that by binding manganese and zinc. So there's all this stuff going on. Um, it's resistant to enzyme degradation. Hmm. So that's, you know, so it, it'll be consistent. It's easy to use in the stool. When you're looking at the gut, it, in, you know, both dogs and people, fecal is a better marker than in the blood because you can look at it in the blood. Um, so it's, it's very specific to inflammation going on in the gut. And in research, it's been related to histology. So they've had studies where they've gone in and looked at the actual cells and within the gut, and they've related that. They've also calprotectant levels, and then they've cor correlated it to clinical severity. 
So mm -hmm. it has a lot of, you know, benefits as to why it's used. So I think of it as, you know, you can use it to identify your level of inflammation. Yeah. You can use it to identify um, if things aren't getting treated. Like if you have a dog who is really sick and then you test the scalp protectant or hers or, and then you, um, you follow up and, you know, you do the things to get them better, they get better, and then you're, you know, I'm all done. But calprotectin can let you see if there's still a low grade mm -hmm. inflammation going on that you just don't yeah. know about. And even in research, they, they have those kind of concerns. You want to make sure that you're looking to see, is it, has it really resolved? Yeah, so I, I love that because I have so many patients where, you know, they come to me because it's like they thought things were fixed. And then they have another flare up of like GI symptoms. All of a sudden they were fine symptomatically. And this is potentially where this test would be really helpful. You know, did the treatment work or are we still having that low grade chronic inflammation brewing in the gut? And it's not high enough where we're necessarily seeing like, you know, blowout diarrhea, GI upset, or, you know, the, all the GI signs that we, we tend to think of when there is a flare up. So I, I love that we now have a test to be able to, to see better how the treatment we're using is actually working. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same in people. So once people have IBD, like in, in people, and it's one of its claims to fame is that it can differentiate IBS from IBD. So yeah. if it's at a certain low level, you probably don't have IB, IBD. You know, it's not one single marker one time yeah. is going to really tell you that, but it does let you see. And I think that, what I'm seeing in the research it, for, for dogs and um, there's some in cats is that they're looking at it, um, I mean, more conventional clinicians, vet clinicians are looking at it as, do I start this super high treatment? Do I go right in for steroid, you know, immunosuppressants, or do I try to do it with food? Mm -hmm. So that's some of the research is looking at that, that dogs that are food responsive you know, that's going to be one level so, or antibiotic responsive, but all you're going to have to do is give them change their diet or give them antibiotics, but dogs that responded. And this is like looking back at some of the research that are steroid or immunosuppressive responsive um, are going to have a much higher level and the non-responsive dogs are higher. So a lot of that research is looking at how to triage what you do, but I think if you want to do it more naturally, it also just lets you know how much more stuff you should do. If it's just kind of a little bit high, maybe you change their dog food a little bit. But if it's really high, you got need to probably bring in a lot of things and do it do it longer. Yeah, and I to t to speak to that too because a lot of I know a lot of the members here today are <laughs> more like the holistic approach and wanting to avoid antibiotics and steroids and immunosuppressives. And as I always say, there's a time and a place for everything, right? And this, what's neat about this is I like that we can actually see that level of inflammation. So as you just beautifully stated, like is it something where maybe if we are feeding a processed food diet like kibble, just transitioning over to a fresh food could make the whole difference. And if that's where you want to start, here's a test that you can actually do again after you've transitioned, you've got them on this diet, and then you could always repeat the test. If there's still inflammation, next level, let's use some herbs, let's use some nutraceuticals and other things that we can use to help clear out that inflammation, support the immune system. So there's so many different ways that we can use this, even from a holistic perspective where we're healing the body and helping them with natural remedies. So Perfect. Yeah, I think it's great too. I mean, because it, it's not, you know, it, it's not just people that they have, like they just have more research and people on the gut brain connection, the gut, you know, heart connection, gut liver, gut skin, they kind of have everything. It really is its own organ. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. So, so tell us a little bit more about like the immune system side and the and how we can assess like, how's immunity? Because that's such a big part, right? That quote, like the 70% of the immune system is in the gut. So tell me a little bit more about that. The other marker we have, you know, in this test, this pair of testing is the secretory IgA. So it's a marker looking at like the first line of defense. It's right there on your mucosal linings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it's on the surfaces. It's closely related to gut bacteria. Um, and 
So it'll, it can bind to bacterial toxins, um, to pathogens. It can stop, you know, kind of blunt down um, inflammation. It kind of go, it goes after foreign antigens. Um, so when we're looking at that with secretory IgA, I think, you know, that there's some interesting stuff that they, they have about it. And one of them was like, um, so we're looking at high, high kind of means that there's an alarm, like, you know, IgA is, and it's, it's either written as SIgA, IgA, secretory IgA, and they're antibodies produced by the, you know, mucosal surfaces. And then about 75% of that IgA is bound to um, commensal bacteria, so good normal flora. So it helps modulate those things. But IgA we can see is really high. So if it's really high, it's identifying something's here and I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. So it, when I see high, I think, okay, something's there and they're working on it. I'm gonna figure out what it is, um, but I'd rather see high, like I can, I can take care of it. So sometimes you'll see low, either they fought something so long that they, uh, they just can't mount as good IgA response as they want. Or there are a lot of dogs that have um, like low IgA levels that, you know, when, when we started doing all the breeding um, to kind of, you know, when dogs stopped working and um, I always want to get my dog a, a, a job because I think <laughs> I love it. <laughs> not, not Linda. Always. I was going to say that's not Linda, right? Linda's retired. She's almost 17 <laughs> years old. <laughs> um, but I, I, so when they, you know, started breeding dogs for those kind of pet traits and they ended up with more hip dysplasia. So you see that more. But one of the other things, they have an increased rate of selective IgA deficiency. Mm. So you don't have IgA and, and, you know, people get it too. And people may not know they have it because you know, IgM, IgG, other things will kind of help compensate. So you may not even know you have that as an issue until you really need it. So, mm -hmm. you know, dogs that might get more GI um, problems or have more respiratory infections, more allergies or autoimmune, it's possible they have impaired secretory IgA. So just kind of looking at that level um, to see, you know, if they have, you know, normal level, if it's really high or low and how it relates to calprotectin. Hmm. Yeah. And so with that, because I see, I mean, those levels can, we see them all the time, like quite low and especially because we're dealing with a lot of chronic illnesses also. Mm -hmm. And so that makes sense and why it's so hard for these pets to overcome a lot of these diseases because their immune system's not working as well as it should, or it's exhausted. Now, in terms of pet parents who have been through like health issues, and say like they had a pet with cancer or chronic allergies or chronic GI symptoms, and they have this brand new puppy, would this be a test where it'd be a great, like, let's get a snapshot of what's going on in the gut to see maybe this puppy has a genetic predisposition to a low IgA. Would that be a useful way to use this? You know, test? I would wait till they're about four months old. Okay. Um, so right away, it's going to be pretty, you know, it takes time to stabilize. Okay. So it, it matures as, as the puppy matures. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. Matures. You know, like in, in, in ba human babies, they have super high calprotectants, like, you know, and they have a lot of opportunistic bacteria because there's more research on, on that. So it's kind of like they're there to fine tune the, you know, newborn immune system. And mm. so there's a lot going on. So you would, you know, you look at those levels from a newborn because it's going to you know, make you think they have IBD and they don't, it's just normal. It's really high. Yeah. Um, so with, with, especially with, with IgA, you, you know, you, it's going to mature as the gut matures. So you don't want to go in and think, oh, there's something wrong. It just takes a little bit for the gut okay. to mature. That's good to know. I know there's a lot of proactive pet parents here who will, will jump all over this. So I don't want them to get like <laughs> false results and then create, you know, false worry and things that they right, don't right. worry about too. So, so if you find like IgA is low, what, tell me a little bit more, can we bring that back up? Or is that something where like, it's all doom and gloom, like good luck, this pet's going to have low immune system, or how does that look with some of the research that? No, I mean, I don't, it, it, it's never doom. I mean, it's never yeah, like, I was right. being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's also, there's, I mean, looking at both these markers, like IgA, like I said, is like 75% is bound to commensal bacteria. 
Mm. So it can also tell you the, the commensal bacteria is, lo is low and anything you can do to increase commensal flora will help increase IgA. So yeah. you want to look at it like that. And if it's, you know, if it's really high, then you might want to just look for those things. There's a lot of associations with E. coli and maybe dysbiosis and an imbalance with that or certain pathogens or, or food reactions. Yeah. So, and I think that's a good point too. A lot of, uh, you know, pet parents are doing the animal biome tests or microbiome tests. And so that's different from what we're looking at here in mm -hmm. terms of you're looking at with your microbiome, we're looking at the diversity, the different strains, all of that, where this, this is going to give us a better idea more so of like function, inflammation, a better idea of like how the things are working together. Would you say that's appropriate? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, they do, do do well together. I mean, you can see mm. things. So, you know, all our tests are looking at, um, you know, what's actually happening. So some of that you may want to know like, oh, if this is really high, it, IgA is really high, but there's no real inflammation, but maybe I want to see what bacteria are there, what commensal bacteria are there. Mm. You know, on the human side, you know, we have tests that are, you know, you have them all together. So what you can kind of see is that, is the bacteria impaired enough that it's causing anything or what, what can you do? So these are, you know, we like these because they're actionable. Like I deal with, you can deal with inflammation, you know, with a test looking at leaky gut or impaired digestion. So, you know, they're actionable, but I think that they, you know, would pair nicely with, the, with the, looking at the microbiome. Yeah. So what would be some good situations for using this individual test? Cause it, you have you have comprehensive gut tests that do include the overall, like all of those that mm -hmm. you just mentioned, which are great. But if someone was to say, I need to pick like one of the smaller tests, where would this be a good example to use the, the calprotectin and the IgA specifically? Yeah, I mean, for to them? me, this is the first test I'd always go for. Okay. Just, I think that it, you know, other like leaky gut or impaired digestion can lead to this, but to me, it's like, I want to know there's, you know, good immune function and no inflammation. Okay. So yeah. I think, I mean, I mean, I didn't, you know, do it on my dogs, although, you know, I, I work at a lab, so it's always hard to say the more information, um, but, you know, as a baseline to see, especially, you know, I like doing it on Linda because she is an older dog and I want to yeah. know if there's something I can kind of just catch earlier that I can kind of help support with her. But any kind of, you know, any GI issue, I would certainly, you know, go with this if, you know, constipation, diarrhea, straining, um, you know, skin conditions, you know, yeah. all those things. I think that to me, it would be a first, a first go-to for really kind of most things, just yeah. because the gut is so correlated to stuff. Yeah. I, we see a lot of behavior issues too. And I think that that gut brain access also, this is where is the gut inflamed is it, and is it now causing inflammation in the brain that's leading to those behavior issues too. So, you know, if we're just giving antidepressants and we're not actually treating the, the inflammation in the gut, this would be a great test to see. So we're not potentially treating the wrong thing or covering up those symptoms and ignoring this chronic inflammation that's occurring too. So, you know, all those chronic diseases, allergies, GI upset, we see a lot of like acid reflux also. There's some other tests too that are really helpful for that, um, that I know you offer too. But, you know, I, I love that we now have a starting place to look more at the function rather than going, you know, invasive with, we need biopsies and all of this to truly, and yes, there's a time and a place for those, don't get me wrong, but it's nice to be able to send in a stool sample, order the test from at like the comfort of your home too, without having to, you know, necessarily go through a veterinarian, of course, work with your veterinarian to identify what's happening and come up with a treatment plan. But I love that these tests have come out because on the human side, they've been so powerful in my own journey with my husband and his IBD. D. And so, you know, it's, it's refreshing to see that now our pets have some options. And so I think we've already touched on like why this is so important, but, you know, ignoring and not seeing inflammation and allowing it to continue is why we end up with autoimmune diseases and cancer and these frustrating health conditions that are really expensive and stressful to deal with. So Dr. Betsy, what can like pet owners do with this information? 
So you kind of briefly mentioned it. You said like if we have a high IgA and a low, like low calprotectin, give me some examples specifically like that you're seeing with the tests that you're doing so far. And then we can talk about some of the things that, you know, pet parents can do right away to start taking action and heal that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, calprotectin, I think, you know, it's going to identify inflammation. It's also going to monitor effectiveness of treatment so you can follow it. Um, the other thing I think of, if there's a lot of um, inflammation, you're going to have decreased um, um, uh, digestion and absorption. Yep. So fixing that's also going to help with it. Um, you know, iron, zinc, fat, that's going to be pretty impacted. And then getting, um, you know, if you impaired digestion absorption, you end up with things in the colon that you probably don't want, like, you know, distal intestines that the bacteria there are, you know, not necessarily going to have a whole bunch of protein at their access. But if there's a lot of inflammation, they may get more of that. Um, and if, there, if it's not being digested. And so those make phenol compounds that can cause their own issues. You know, just like the inflammation and the uh, neurotransmitters, you know, with the brain in people, if that's that inflammatory reaction pulls like tryptophan, which normally goes to make serotonin, that'll get pulled down an inflammatory pathway and there's none left to make serotonin. You'll see mm. those serotonin breakdown. So the inflammation itself, I think, you know, there are a lot of conditions that I would look for. Um, and then it also helps when, when people are going into like, are they really in remission? Mm. So, you know, I think I would look at those Together, if IgA is good, I'm going to feel a little more optimistic and, and calprotectin is high. I'm going to focus on anti-inflammatories and, I, you know, changing diet. And I have less concern that, you know, diets is big impact because IgA can go up with, with some food reactions. Um, and they're less concerned that there's a parasite that I need to go find or an imbalance in the gut bacteria, that it's, it's the inflammation I need to deal with. Hmm. So start looking at, you know, and the first thing, I mean, even in research is changing the diet, but yep. that depends on what is your current diet. Yep. Yep. So, you know, I, it, maybe you need to go all raw food, maybe, you know, or you can make your own food, maybe you can just do a topper, but if it's really high, you may want to, you know, be a little more aggressive and then work down from there. Yeah. And I think too, this is, there's a lot of talk about, you know, diets, nutrition, and it can be quite a controversial topic as we were talking about before. <laughs> and this is where though it's, this can be a really powerful test to showing us that if we do have that high level of inflammation and we were feeding, you know, a kibble diet that's cooked at high heat temperatures, has a lot of chemicals in it that are being produced by those high heat processing techniques. And then we switch them and we test like we're going to see, and you don't change anything else. Like that can also show us, but I also love what you said too. Like sometimes the diet change isn't enough or going to make that difference. And so being able to, and I see this too, where you change to a raw food diet and it didn't make a difference. So especially with like allergies, this happens all the time. Like, oh, I changed from kibble to raw. All these people had their allergies go away with their pets and it did nothing. So maybe that's where like the IgA and the immunity or the immune system's off. And that's mm -hmm. actually the problem. It's not the level of inflammation that's in the gut. So yeah, so and you might have to try a little harder on this particular food or this food or this compound. Yeah. yeah. Or and using also, like herbs and things like that to help regulate and making sure like the prebiotics and if there's, you know, issues there too, um, making sure we're feeding the good bacteria and supporting supporting, you know, short chain fatty acid production and all of that also, um, those right. are important things too. Yeah. Antioxidants are good. I mean, in IgA, um, Saccharomyces boulardii, that's, you know, good research yep. that's in people and humans. Um, so, and then I think that, um, like the standard process chlorophyll, I Yes. Mentioned in one of your very complex. Nice videos. Yeah. Yes. The chlorophyll complex is amazing. Um, there's so many, and that once again, that's like a whole food supplement. So rather than extracting out, you know, isolates of these vitamins and minerals or nutrients, you know, using whole foods to feed the good stuff, but also use that to reduce inflammation and support the gut lining and the microbiome itself. 
Um, so yeah, there's there's so many different ways to approach it. And the Saccharomyces boulardii is a common one we use, and it's a great starting place um, for supporting the immune system and its immunomodulatory properties and, and helping the microbiome. Um, so in terms of, I would love for, like before we take some questions, I would love a couple different um, main takeaways that you have, Dr. Betsy, that you'd wanna leave with pet parents whatever you feel compelled to share that you think will be the best way to like use these tests or how can best help them to get people started with it. I, mean, I would start with the, if you don't know where to start, start with the inflammation and immunity. Um, and it, you can see like it, it may be that they're both fine. Your dog's yep. doing well. And then what, what the lifestyle, like, you know, the recommendation on that is just keep doing what you're doing. Yep. You know, so that's kind of always good to know, like, you know, this is working out so you know what the, the whatever system you have set up but then if one of those are elevated you can just you can address it they're not you know it's not just me and you know alternative type of medicine or veterinary stuff saying that there's a lot of good research i have all these you know <laughs> studies that i'm always looking at um but you know they even talk about like you know kibble and then kibble that's fed, you know, that's excessively like um, dried or cooked and the, the impact. So, you know, the whole research knows that it's going to have more inflammatory um, response. You know, it makes those AGEs that, that cause things. So um, I, I just think it's it may seem overwhelming. That's like maybe starting with two, like just two tests, like, yeah. the, you know, the IGA, the calprotectant is an easy way to build from there. Um, and then if you don't get response, you can do some other ones, but they're, you know, they're good recommendations on there. I think if, 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 you know, if, if there's an elevation then and your diet is just currently kibble, then start to look at, you know, making your own food yeah. You know, yeah. from there. So I, I, it's, I see the same thing in, 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 in people. So, I mean, that's how we transition to our pets is because we <laughs> had pets with problems and we're like, wait a second, they're not a different, you know, they're, you know, they're not aliens, they're mammals, just like us. They have, you know, a stomach and intestines and a gallbladder and, you know, a liver. So it's not like they're so foreign. So a lot of the things that work for people can work for, for pets. So, yeah. And I love that. I think that's really, really important. And I always say this too, because it's, we've gotten kind of away. I mean, there's more of a shift now, which is great, but we've gotten so ingrained with that. Like we have to feed our pets processed food because if we get away from it, we'll unbalance their diets and create harm. And there's no way we would follow that for, or we shouldn't be following that for ourselves. I know everyone's diets are different, but we know that processed food for humans all the time is really bad. And so we have to have that mind shift and shift our belief system a little bit and look at also all the research that's, that's out there um, to actually show us. And like, what's neat now is being able to introduce a lot of these testing so we can even get more research to show this. Mm -hmm. So one question that I do have that I probably, a lot of people will be wondering is, so say they do this test and it comes back a little bit abnormal. How often would you recommend retesting with this? We generally say if, you know, three to six months. Okay. So, you know, then, then you can see changes. I wouldn't, you know, if you do it too soon, you're not going to see changes and stuff. So I think that, you know, three to six months is about when you would start to see okay. the impact of what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Awesome. So for everyone here live on the call, um, if you have a question, drop it in the Q&A box. We have a few minutes for to answer a couple questions because I know this is kind of like a newer idea area for a lot of people. So um, drop those questions. I see them. Let me bring this box up so I can ask Dr. Betsy. Let's see. Okay, so, and I don't know if um, you'll be able to, if you're familiar with Dr. Jean Dodd's food sensitivity test, the NutriScan, I'll be able to, so yeah, Anthony, just, are you familiar with that one? I'm not IGG familiar. I'm not, I'm not thinking, is that IgG or is that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not, IgG. it's not measuring IgE. So it's looking more at food sensitivities versus allergies. So there, 
Angelo is asking, what's the difference between your test and the food sensitivity test? So probably wondering like the difference between IgA versus some of these, you know, IgE, some of these other like immunoglobulins. Right, IgE is going to be, you know, classic allergic. Um, IgG tends to be more of a, and I haven't seen the test, but just in general, um, you know, IgG tends to be looking at like a longer term food reaction. It's a, it's been a blocking agent for IgE in some um, respects. So, you know, we generally think of that and IgG total has a half-life of <laughs> 21 days. So usually it's like, if you exclude it for 21 days in people, and I'm not sure in pets that, you know, you'll, you can start to see that those come down. So those are, you know, more in a blood reaction. Um, IgA is happening right at the mucosal lining. So it's right there. It's the, you know, the first line of defense, I always think of it as like the bouncer, like, can you come in here? <laughs> I like that. Let me see who you are, you know, um, and trying to decide like who can come in and how many, you know, more IG, how many bouncers do they need to get out there to like take care of something? But I think that it would really just tell you what's going on at that immune lining at the mucosal services and, and, and uh, IgG is going to be you know, more systemic. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly how I would explain those differences. So with food sensitivity testing, um, once again, there's pros and cons to everything. And a lot of times, if you're worried about that, one of the things we recommend is doing a food elimination trial. Um, mm -hmm. That can be one of the easiest. It's also cheaper um, where you're eliminating the foods that your pet's been on before and you're using novel proteins that they've never been exposed to and keeping the diet very simple. Um, that typically has to be like six to eight weeks, um, but that is definitely something you could do. But, you know, as we've been talking about with this immunity inflammation panel by in Innovative Pet Lab, there's a link also on the Facebook page that will also go out to everyone here where you can see and take a look and see if you want to order this test with a discount code too. Um, but knowing like, is there inflammation in the gut lining is really important for that also. And then also that IgE or sorry, IgA that Dr. Betsy just talked about, like, are we are we allowing things in that shouldn't be coming in too? Or how well is that immune system working? So um, that was a great question. Now, let's see. Okay, I got my first one down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let's we see. also see, it, you know, that in a lot, if you have a lot of IgGs, it's oftentimes associated with leaky gut, you know, so yep. that is that one. That's great to know. I know a lot of times the, the blood the blood test with food allergies in pets isn't super sensitive. It's very, and so you can get mixed results. That's, so that's why I always say like doing a food trial is going to be the most helpful. It just can be more time consuming. So, you know, we like fast results, but I always recommend that. Um, this is a great question from Catherine. Does this test work for cats? Um, it should. Um, we are validating cats right now. So um, it's just real easy to get dog poop. <laughs> we sent in our cat stuff, which was really neat to see. Okay, to good. Them. Yeah. So yeah. we just have to get, you know, enough cats. And then we were doing some studies just like, does it make any difference? You know, if you have cat litter on it and, you know, those kind of things. So yeah, you, know, you can go to a dog park, you know, with a cup of coffee and offer to buy people a cup of coffee if they can have, they can have their dog poop. That's been done. <laughs> <laughs> and cats are a little harder so yeah but we are working on it and and looking at the research yes okay perfect because i know we've got a lot of cat people there's a lot of cat questions in terms of does this test work for cats um so and i can tell you like from what we've seen with our test results too um it 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 correlated with how strong, like there's no symptoms, no GI symptoms, there's no allergies. So that was really nice to see, obviously take it with a grain of salt because you're finalizing everything, but, and it was really easy to do. That's what was really nice about the test and the whole process. And then also the reports in the back end. Um, I really thought that process was really easy to follow, do, understand, and your customer, customer support's awesome, which I really appreciate too. Um, in terms of the testing, right now it's only available in the U.S. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, um, 
I mean, it's yeah. stool, so it's hard to get samples sent in and all of that also with customs and things like that. So, um, and yeah, so right now only the U.S., but it doesn't mean that you can't do stuff to help support your pet's gut health. So just because if you can't uh, access and we would, test, yeah, if we certainly want to be able to, at least, you know, get to Canada. So. Okay, perfect. So Canada's yeah. coming. All right. So hopefully, yeah, I don't, yeah, we're looking at what all it entails. It's really just, you know, arranging the, uh, the U.S. mail. Okay. Yeah. My, uh, I'm, I'm half Canadian. My mother. We got to get it up there then, right? <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do have a lot of Canadians here. So, uh, we do have a big Canadian population in our community. So I know a lot of people will be really happy to hear that. Um, in terms of, so where can they get these tests? Once again, this is Innovative Pet Lab. So innovativepetlab.com. And you can use code NATURALPET25 to get 25% off of those tests. You can order it straight from the comfort of your home if you're in the US. And there's great instructions on how to send a stool sample back and then you'll get a report. How long does those results usually take to receive? Well, our turnaround time is two weeks. Okay. So um, it should be, you know, no longer than two, two weeks. So we just you know, we run the test every two weeks as they come in. Okay, um, perfect. And, yes. you know, if, if you're in Canada and you want to run it, you can reach out to us and we can, you know, see what right. the demand is and how quickly we need to <laughs> Perfect. that. Awesome. And I'm getting some questions, quite a few questions on, would the test be beneficial for dogs with acid reflux? And then another one, same test for chronic inflammation as well as for acid reflux. So, I mean, I think that it would, it's gonna be different as far as, it, you know, acid reflux could have an impact because it's all connected. I don't know, I haven't specifically looked at, which would of course really be interesting to me, like dogs with and without acid reflux, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to work for anybody because it's not, it's just identifying the level of inflammation and in immunity. So it's just telling you what it is. Mm -hmm. So um, you kind of have to just try to bring it down. It's possible, and I'm just guessing this, like if, if you tried to bring it down, it didn't come down, maybe that would be one of the areas you would look at. So, but I haven't seen the correlation. Certainly yeah. with people, it doesn't tend to be a big correlation. Mm. Uh, with the calprotectant, except if it's partly due to if somebody has like, you know, H. pylori that can affect everything kind of downstream and that can change the microbiome in the gut, which then can lead to more inflammation. Mm. Yeah. I think too, with a lot of acid reflux, this is a big one for diet, but also to supporting, you know, the the proper levels of stomach acid and digestive enzymes too. I find that a lot. Chlorophyll complex, what we were just mentioning too, is also a really good option to help like soothe and calm. Um, but this is where using things like slippery elm or marshmallow root are a really great soothing mucilage that can also help coat inflammation. So while you're trying to figure out like, why is this happening and you're making some adjustments, those are some great like supplements to help get your pets started on to help with that symptom, help ease those symptoms because acid reflux, as we know personally, if you've ever had, it does not feel good. And so it's really hard to watch our, our dogs, you know, go through that and feel that. Um, okay. Let's see. Lots of questions that we've answered, which is great. Please come to Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> you. you know, something else I think that can impact inflammation which I was surprised to even find it in the research was just being outside in nature. There was a study like, oh, just, yeah. you know, yep. just go out, get your dog outside. If your dog's inside that all the time, you know, or, you know, you're letting your cat out or just, yeah. you know, I think that those kind of things you know, can have an impact. I mean, I know like that seeing the research, even for people on grounding, like yes. they did a study and, and they were college athletes and some of them slept outside on the ground and some of them just slept <laughs> in their to college dorm and they did it for a week. And the people who slept on the ground outside had lower inflammatory markers. Yep. So. I love that. I, we talk a lot about emotional health as one of like the foundations of health, like one of the pillars. And this is that direct connection too. I imagine there's that gut brain access, your, your, 
the hormones that you're producing to that feel good, that gut feeling, right? When we're outside in the forest, who like who would rather be in a huge city <laughs> surrounded by people, traffic noises and pollution, or would you rather be surrounded by nature and quiet solitude? And I mean that could be different for every person, but I would much prefer being surrounded by nature and you know, you feel different energetically and that impacts your cellular health too, which is so amazing. So it's neat that you can actually see that. Um, yeah. you know, it's always fun because you're like, well, it's the gut feeling, right? And you know, <laughs> no, we can actually measure it. There's less inflammation there. Um, so I love that you brought that up because animals need to get outside. They need exercise. It's going to impact their gut health. It's going to impact the level of inflammation. It's going to impact your relationship with them and how you feel personally too. And so many people have the same health conditions as their pets. So because we're so closely interconnected, so definitely take care of yourself by doing, you know, some of these simple things to improve your health and your pet's health also. But so one final question I have, and I don't know if you'll be, if if you know this answer or not, because there's, there may not be studies for it, but my dog has severe seborrhea. So this is like an autoimmune skin disease where they flake off their skin. Um, and it's usually for life and using medicated shampoos is one of the ways to help treat it. Would this test be helpful for her? Well, you're right. I haven't looked at the research for that. I know low levels of secretory IgA can be associated with, you know, atopic dermatitis, but um, I would say that even if there's not like research that connects it, if you, your dog also has increased inflammation, then that's going to probably just make it harder to treat overall. Like yeah. It's always a good idea to just bring down inflammation that you see. Yeah. So, so I think like test is not going to do any harm. It can give you more information, potentially if there's something aggravating that's contributing to having it being harder to treat, or, you know, I know with a lot of these patients too, they'll have like flare-ups, whether it's seasonal allergies coming in also. So I think it's good to make sure we're not missing something. And I think some of these tests that we're talking about, and we'll be talking about in the future are great options that you could always start with to make sure things are good. And we're not just assuming and, you know, hoping that things continue fine. And, when especially now we can test and then get a handle on things and take control and make sure that we're doing as much as possible. So I love all of this. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> I know you have so many amazing research studies too. So I'd love for you to share some of those with me afterwards so I can share these with the community so that they can dive in and see that oh, yeah. there a is a ton of research. So, because that's commonly one of the things that I hear, there's not enough research out there for our pets. So I know you've got like a stack full of stuff. Oh yeah, this but... one I really liked. It's biomarkers of gastrointestinal functionality and animal nutrition and health. Yes, and it, I love it. it. We'll it share over, it yeah, I'll, I'll send it. Yeah, I'll send you the PDF. It just looks at like diet, digestion, inflammation, you know, all these different neuroendocrine. Yeah. So. Perfect. So the page I'll... turner. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So for everyone here, I appreciate all of you taking time out of your day, whatever time of day it is, wherever you're joining from in the world. I know we have people here from all over uh, the world, which is really exciting. And once again, you can get these tests, these stool tests from Innovative Pet Lab, simple innovativepetlab.com. And you can use code naturalpet25. I'll be sharing this all, all in an email um, and with the replay so you can re-listen to all the amazing information and knowledge that Dr. Betsy shared with us today. Um, I'd love to hear just some final words from you, Dr. Betsy. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. I mean, so we're trying to make tests that we think are going to help you know, pet owners um, and, and every day taking care of their, their pets. I mean, we worked in functional medicine for years and then we were like, hey, I'd like to apply this to my pet. I don't want to do all these other things. I don't want to start them on meds. Can I just see where they are in this state? You know, and so we're like, hey, we can. So I love that. Yeah, yeah it's great. This is exactly what we've needed. And so I'm so excited that 
you and your company have decided to do just that. Um, for anyone here who is needing more guidance and help and support with their pet's gut health, we are also doing interviews uh, for our upcoming six-week gut health intensive program that includes some personalized testing that can be done alongside these innovative pet lab tests, and then also guidance support and educational program to help you get the results that you're looking for. So if you need some help with that, definitely check out the link in the Facebook area. I'll be sharing that with you too, um, because we're just taking a small group of pet parents to go through that program and get you the results and transformation that you're looking for. I'll also be sharing some of our favorite supplements for healing the gut um, and a link to that. So you can take a look at some of the brands that we trust, love, and like, and use for our clients to help heal the chronic inflammation, support uh, the immune system, and help you get the results you need to. So thank you again for everyone showing up, taking time out of your day to be the most amazing pet parents that you are. Um, and we'll keep you posted on any future lives that we do to share more about this incredible company, Innovative Pet Lab, and all the amazing things that Dr. Betsy and the rest of her team are doing. All right, everyone. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Betsy. Thank you.